In this video, we're going to review the fundamentals of material and energy balances. Hopefully this will be a brief review for most of you um, and that you've had some of this before in your prior courses, but it may be useful in thinking about building models um, for your future designs in this course. So fundamentally, material and energy balances is an accounting problem in engineering where we have something going into a system has to equal what's coming out of the system, right? So n equals out, and the system in this case would be this uh, green cube. And this is because of the laws of conservation of mass and energy. <coughs> so more specifically, n has to equal out plus accumulation. So for example, if you had water pouring into this cube, there'd be a rate of water going in, dn dt, potentially a rate of water coming out, d out dt, and then potentially this cube could be filling with water so there could be a rate of accumulation. Negative accumulation can also occur and this would be when there's generation in your system. And this tends to happen in biological systems when there's a conversion or reaction that can be mathematically represented um, that leads to the production of something in your system. Um, and most things can be represented by a combination of accumula accumulation um, and or generation. So for example, metabolism would be one case for this. You can model um, the ins and outs of a cell um, in terms of the rates in this case. So we have the rate of sugar going into the cell, the rate of sugar coming out of the cell, the rate of carbon dioxide going into the cell, and the rate of carbon dioxide going out of the cell. Now, of course, cells traditionally eat sugar and produce carbon dioxide when they metabolize. They don't eat CO2 and they don't excrete sugar. So we would have these two terms set to zero, which means that for, for CO2 to be coming out of the cell, there has to be some sort of reaction going on in the cell to convert the sugar into the CO2. And so inside the cell, there would have to be a generation of carbon dioxide um, and uh, consumption of sugar to make the math work. So this in equals out plus accumulation can be applied to all sorts of different materials. It can be applied to mass, particles, charges, molecules, electrons, protons, you name it. And it can also be applied to different energy. Um, so work, heat, free energy, enthalpy, etc. When we look at the rate of change through these dynamic systems, we can model them using a chemical engineering approach as a flux or J. Um, so flux, uh, the nomenclature here is J equals the change in something over time. All right? So dy dt could be energy, it could be particle dt, it could be an electron dt, etc. Um, additionally, a flux is defined as not only the, the movement of molecules per time or energy, etc. per time, but also per unit area. So flux is defined as the rate of change over an area into your system. And so when we're modeling dynamic physical systems, there are some pretty simple basic rules to start to build on how we model these fluxes and model these systems. The first rule is if there's something changing with time, there is usually a flux, right? Makes sense. If there's something changing with time, there has to be something changing with time. So in this case, we have J, which equals dy dt, and the dy dt is the flux or the physical movement of something. Rule number two, if there is a flux in a physical system, there has to be a driving force. Um, things just don't move on their own. Um, these can be different types of driving forces. There could be a concentration gradient. It could be a temperature gradient. Um, it could be an electrochemical gradient. Um, it could be a voltage, for example. Um, but there's a driving force which leads to the flux. And what relates the driving force to the flux is a coefficient, a correlation coefficient. Now, these coefficients have been modeled and analyzed and interpreted um, different ways. Depending on the driving force you're talking about, these have different names. So for diffusion, for example, it would be diffusivity. It could be a heat transfer coefficient um, or an oxygen transfer coefficient in this course, um, a mass transfer coefficient. Um, but generally, they're just correlation coefficients used to relate the driving force to the physical movement. Rule number three, there can be more than one driving force affecting the flux of any given molecule, and the effects are additive. So for example, for a particular molecule, you may have three different driving forces acting on that molecule. It could be a concentration gradient, it could be a charge, um, it could be temperature, and each of these would have a different correlation coefficient or um, coefficient, A1, A2, A3, and the additive effect would lead to the net flux of that molecule or energy. Um, make sure you count for the signs, right? You could have one driving force pushing something in one direction and another driving force pushing it in another direction. So you make sure you count for the signs when you're doing the addition.
Rule number four, driving forces and coefficients can also vary with time or as a function of other variables, such as space. Um, and so that makes sense. If you think about um, diffusion, for example, things move from a concentration, a high concentration to a low concentration. But as they move, the concentration gradient um, is decreased, and so the driving force would change over time. But in general, each of these driving forces and coefficients can be functions of time, which is why you may need to solve these pesky math ODEs and partial differential equations when you're solving these systems of equations that you're going to build. The fifth rule is that material and energy balances can be used along with boundary conditions to help you solve your equations, right? So you can have initial conditions, so what's happening at time zero. You can have final conditions, what's happening at the end of uh, your experiment or your system time. You can have physical boundaries. You can have theoretical maximum or minimum. And those all can help you um, uh, solve your differential equations. So in the case of one-dimensional diffusion, if we go through this, right, diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, so from C1 to C2 along a direction x through an area, right? So this would be a flux, dy dt, where y would be moles of something, and it's a function of a coefficient and a driving force. So in this case, dy dt would equal d, d moles of C over time. And the driving force would be the concentration gradient, which would be the change in concentration of C across, along this um, axis X. Um, for diffusion, the coefficient is the diffusivity D. Right? So in this case, um, the negative sign is actually pretty important. Right? You have two molecules um, in the positive direction of X. You have two molecules of C, and there's maybe 15 molecules of C uh, over here. So the concentration gradient in the positive direction of x is 2 minus 15, which would be minus 13. Of course, the flux is in the positive direction of x, and that's how we get the negative sign. Right? The units of flux, as we mentioned before, are moles per time per area. And the units of the driving force in this case are concentration per time, which is moles to the meter to the fourth. Right? This comes from the fact that the concentration, you know, a molar would be moles per liter or moles per volume. So that would be moles per meter cubed. And then we have another meter here on the bottom or another length, which would be the dx. And that's how we get to the 4 here. So to make these units work, the units for diffusivity um, by necessity have to be meters squared per second, which, in, which would, um, when multiplied by the, the concentration gradient and the driving force, would give you the flux that you want. And of course, this leads to Fick's law, right? So diffusion is the movement of molecules from high concentration to lower concentration through a given area. And this may look more familiar for those of you who've taken um, uh, earlier courses. Of course, diffusivity or any other uh, correlation coefficient can be modeled, and they do have they are a function of physical parameters or chemical parameters. Um, so in the case of diffusivity in aqueous solutions, it's a function of temperature, viscosity, and particle size. So we have mobility, the Boltzmann constant, temperature all affect the diffusion coefficient. And we can use a Stokes-Einstein equation, which was experimentally determined, um, to relate the mobility to the size of the particle and the, the viscosity or dynamic viscosity of the fluid, right? So the R would be the size of the particle, the radius of the particle, and this would be the, the fluid viscos dynamic viscosity. And every, diff every correlation coefficient that you may come across may have a different um, derivation, but in general, they are relating the driving force to the flux. So then we need to think about how we look at the system as a whole. So we have N equals out, right? Um, and we have n equals out into um, a larger system like a cube, we have to consider not just the per area fl the flux, but also the flow. So the flow would be the integral of the flux over the area. Right? So mass flow rate, for, for example, would be, um, in the case of mass particles or moles of something, would be the integral of the flux, which in this case is diffusive flux, um, over the entire area that it's moving. So you basically have the integral of the um, flux over the area, and which in this case gives you diffusion coefficients times the area times the, the driving force. And that would be the same for any sort of system you're modeling. Um, if it's a simple geometry, it's pretty easy to calculate the area and then multiply that by the flux to get your flows in and out. So to summarize, flux uh, dy dt is very simple. Um, it's basically the function of a driving force um, times a coefficient. Um, this may be useful in keeping in mind when you start, start to build some models um, in this course that you need to solve um, in your future designs.